Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Susan, um, and Dean McMahon. It's really a great honor to be here. And I have a few opening comments while we get this PowerPoint presentation booted up. Um, the first is, thanks for making us feel welcome. We were coming down the 401, and when we got to the Snyder's sign on the 401, it started to rain. So we knew we were getting close to Waterloo. <laughs> Brought back some good old memories. The second is that um, for all of the biologists in the audience, I really, truly believe this is the century of biology. Uh, the last century was the, probably the century of physics, and maybe the one before that, chemistry, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I'll hope to con convey to you that um, this is the century of biology, in particular, uh, biology's impact on medicine. And lastly, it's always nice to come to Waterloo because um, I think people are much more open-minded here. We're in, at the University of Toronto, we're not allowed to say McGill University at all. <laughs> uh, we, we can say uh, Waterloo, of course, but McGill is, is definitely out. So in thinking about what I would talk about today, um, I, I thought about the impact that genomics is having on society as a whole. And I'll talk mainly about uh, the impact in, in medicine, but uh, really in the understanding of uh, ourselves, uh, what we are, who we are. So this is the title of my presentation. And this is just an opinion piece I wrote in the Globe and Mail a few, few years ago that helped me develop some of my thoughts. And it came out at a time when um, the first human genome sequence of an individual was being published. Of, this is of Craig Venter. That's his image the shadow you see there. Uh, so I think about some of the impact. I think you always look in the mirror in the morning, and probably most people don't do this enough, and, and take a good look at yourself and, you know, what impact am I having in, in society, in my family, in my life? And, and I think as we start to understand our human genome sequence, as I'll explain to you throughout my presentation, we'll understand ourselves in a much more uh, complete way. And the reason for this is the genome, which is the complete complement of DNA that you have in all of the cells in your body, as I'll show you in my next slide, is the only form of information that I'm aware of that actually captures data on our past, our present, and our future. It's a defined binary code, and as I'll try to explain to you in my presentation, um, I see it as a common language for medicine. Uh, so this is what I'm going to present to you, and, and I'll just go through a few introductory slides, realizing that there are some expert biologists in the field, and this is quite rudimentary information, but try to bring everybody up to the, to the same speed. So as I mentioned, the genome, this is the collection of all of the genes, the DNA, uh, in every cell in your body. So each of us is comprised of something in the order of about 75 trillion cells, depending on your size. I'm a medium-sized medium person, probably uh, 75 trillion cells. If you're Shaquille O'Neal, you may have 150 trillion trillion cells or so. And this guy here, Albert Einstein, probably had more cells in his brain than, than most of us, or at least some of them working uh, differently. But, um, but every single cell in your body, other than the red blood cells, have the same complement of DNA. And you inherit half of your DNA, or your chromosomes. The DNA is packaged in finite molecules called, called chromosomes. You inherit um, uh, 23 chromosomes from your mom, and, and or, sorry, chromosome, half your chromosomes from your mom and half, half your chromosomes from your your father, so you have 46 chromosomes. Uh, and so, so, as I said, all of your cells have the same complement of this, this uh, DNA. And strung along the DNA are um, the segments uh, or of, of the, the code that uh, encode for proteins. So the, these are the genes. And, and at the present time, uh, if you count all of the genes that encode for proteins, there's about 23,000 in every cell in, in your body. And the proteins, of course, are the molecules that go out and perform function in the cell. So these are things like collagen and, and elastin and insulin, for example, enzymes that provide a, a, a perform reactions. Um, we think there's probably something in the order of 100,000 proteins per tissue that you would look at. Uh, there's many different splicing forms. The brain is probably the most complex uh, organ that has perhaps, uh, um, perhaps up to a million different proteins. But they're all encoded by these 23,000 genes. And of course, the DNA is, DNA is comprised of these chemical bases of information, um, which are cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. And you have this, uh, this, this complementary base pairing. And this is really the code of information that's passed on from one cell to another and from one organism to another. It's the code of life, the so-called double helix, the code of life. So this is really your biology 101 for the rest of the presentation. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about variation, and there's different forms of variation. There's single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are uh, changes when you have a single alteration in your DNA sequence. So instead of having, say, a guanine or a G here, you may have a thymine or adenine. And more recently, um, our group and others have discovered a, a genome-wide copy number variation of genes in your genome. So it was thought for many, many years um, that you always had one copy of each gene inherited from each of your parent. And there were a few uh, uh, examples in the literature demonstrating that this was not always the case, but more recently using new technologies, as, as President uh, Johnson pointed out, we have new technologies that I'll talk a little bit later that allow us to see the DNA at a much higher resolution and we can see dimensional forms of the DNA. We now know that actually copy number variation in genes is a, is a predominant form of actually genetic variation in the human genome. And I'll come back uh, to this a little bit later when I talk about how genetic variation is involved in disease. But what I want to really emphasize is that um, the effect of genes is not always absolute. So I'm going to talk a little bit about nature and nurture. Uh, and even though we inherit certain genes in some cases, they are absolute. In other cases, they are not. So the effects of genes can be mitiga mitigated by uh, influences in your lifestyle. Okay, so then on the other end of the spectrum, so that, that was, your, that was your, your nurture. This is, uh, as I mentioned, your genome is really is, is what you are. Okay, so I'll come back to this over and over again. And, and, and who you are is your nurture. This is, this is probably the most influential, uh, uh, at least human beings on my life. This is my family here. And I have three brothers, and I, I would argue that probably birth order and gender are just as influential as the genome, the chromosomes and genes that you inherit. And the influence, of course, of your upbringing, your, your environment, and, and uh, um, of course your diet and all the other influences as you're growing up, your education, the university you go to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is really what we call your nurture, your environment. But what I want to point out is that the genome actually influences your environment. And it influences, as I'll talk about a little bit later, the decisions that you make in your lifetime. And again, they're not absolute, but it does influence your personality, behavior, and certainly your genome is involved in, in disease. Uh, and I'll talk a, quite a bit about this in my presentation. So, you know, like it or not, uh, if you just have to ask your spouse this, you are one half of each of your parents. And you spend most of your adolescence really fighting, fighting this as you're growing up. You know, I'm going to be different than my parents. But as you get older, you start to act like you know, one of your parents. Usually, your, your father, for a male, it's usually your father and female, your mother. Uh, and you just have to ask, ask your spouse. So ultimately, I think nurture wins out over, over uh, your nature. But we'll talk more about that. OK, so um, this is a slide I show to high school students when I give general presentations. And I think this is one of the things that you'll remember most. If you compare the DNA of any two individuals in the world population, it's very, very identical. Uh, it, in fact, it's probably um, something in the order of 98.5% identical. We have a paper coming out in Nature in about two weeks that uh, gives the latest tally of, of the total complement of DNA variation in, in human populations. So um, the reason for this is we share a common humanity. Um, the human species migrated out of Africa, Central Africa, only about 100,000 or so years ago. Uh, so the collection of genetic variation um, that accumulated is, is really, really quite young if you look at the, the large time scale in, in, um, in, in evolution as a whole. And now what's really powerful about this is because the genome is so large, the genome is encoded by 3 billion chemical bases, these A, T, Cs, and Gs, uh, and from each parent. In fact, in total, 6 billion chemical bases of information. Every 0.1% difference is 3 million DNA base differences. Okay, so we're very, very common, but because the genome is so large, actually we're unique in our own way. And many of these genetic variations underlie uh, the features, uh, physical features and behavioral features in our bodies. One only has to look at identical twins. Identical twins or monozygotic twins have the exact same genome. So we think there's some new data suggests there may be some minor modifications, but they have the same genome. Um, so they look the same, this is why. So, so these influences of DNA are, in many cases, quite absolute. So again, a take home message here is you really are the sum of your genes, the influence of your environment, your nurture, uh, the decisions you make in your lifetime, but also chance, depending on perhaps where you're born. People who are born in certain com co countries would have a greater advantage in advancement based on education than others and things like this. <coughs> 
So it's really the composite of all this beautiful, you know, the beautiful information captured uh, through human genetic variation, which is shown here. So we're very, very common, but also very, very unique. Um, more recently now, we have a better understanding through the studies that uh, Susan was talking about, comparative genomic studies, and this is comparative genomic studies within our own species, um, the human family tree, that link uh, the human genome sequence across primate sequences and all the way through um, for essentially conserved genes all the way down to yeast and bacteria. And what I've shown here is some of the coolest science that I find, I think, that's going on here. If you look at the, um, the top end of the, of the human species here, you can see Homo sapiens. And um, on the left-hand side is, is Neanderthal. So there's a, a few papers that have been published, and there's a new one coming out uh, in, in a few months in Nature where a group uh, has identified DNA sequence from ancient um, bones, actually from Neanderthal individuals, they're over 40,000 years old, uh, from caves in Germany and Spain, and able to actually sequence bits and pieces of the DNA from the mitochondria and the nucleus of, of Neanderthal individuals. And in biology, for a long time, there's the uh, outstanding question of was there actually um, uh, interbreeding between Homo sapiens and, and Neanderthal? And the data suggests now that, in fact, that did, probably didn't happen, or if it did happen, it was, it was insignificant. So, in fact, now we better understand our own place in the human evolutionary tree. And just a few years ago, um, another uh, uh, um, human-like species was identified, so Homo fl uh, flore florensiensis, which is the, uh, uh, Frodo, um, the Frodo individuals identified in Polynesia a few years ago. Uh, and there's been a few papers published now looking at the physiology uh, of these, these individuals. These are these short, very um, uh, dwarfs. And at least based on physiology, and there is actually DNA sequence data that will be coming relatively soon, it looks like these are a, a separate lineage of, from Homo sapiens. So this type of DNA sequence comparison, looking back into our past, okay, and we're going now 40,000 in, uh, years into our past here, or more, um, gives us information on our, on our present and our future as a species. Um, the genes that we inherit uh, within our species actually give us human characteristics, and there's many, many examples here, uh, but I've just summarized a few. The FOXP2 gene uh, is a gene on chromosome 7 that we worked on for many years, was identified as the, uh, it was dubbed in the press, the uh, speech and language d uh, gene. So there are specific DNA sequence changes um, in humans that we don't see in any primates or any lower uh, species, um, that it's been assumed to be involved in um, the acquisition of, of language in the human species. And the reason we can actually make that assumption is there are individuals and families in the population who have mutations at those specific DNA sequences who do not have the, the ability of proper uh, speech and language. They have a speech and language disorder, actually. And in fact, we see some of these changes in autistic individuals I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, more recently, there was a, a gene, um, the very low density lipoprotein receptor gene uh, in chromosome 17, identified in a, a, a rare family, in a, a consanguineous family uh, from Pakistan who walked on all fours. Uh, and this was a, not a behavioral decision, but in fact, it's a, it's a, their brain has an imbalance and they, they just can't um, make the uh, connection to walk upright. So you might imagine that these type of changes that occur in DNA sequences in individuals uh, throughout evolution would lead to um, um, divergence of particular species. And this is a real photograph. These are uh, uh, individuals from uh, Central America who have a form of um, hypertrichosis. This, is, this in this family is an X-linked disorder where these children uh, are actually born and they, they do not have excess hairy hairiness on their body until they're uh, in their adolescence, early adolescence. Um, and they have uh, what's called Wolfman syndrome disorder. And uh, while the gene is not identified on the X chromosome, there is a gene on chromosome 17 that has been identified in this, this disorder. So you might then imagine that based on some of these genes that are involved in physical att attributes, it would influence, of course, uh, how we evolve as a species and how we see ourselves as a species. Personality and behavior, so uh, this is very, very controversial, things like intelligence. By studying families that have uh, um, specific mutations in genes, we gather a lot of information. But in particular, by looking at monozygotic twins, 
uh, that in many cases may be separated at birth and raised in different environments, one can track the heritability of these different um, uh, characteristics, traits, or, or disorders. So things like depression, extroversion, vocational interest, novelty seeking, dyslexia, schizophrenia, um, have a very high heritability in, in uh, monozygotic twins. Um, for example, in, in autism spectrum disorder, which, which we study in our laboratory, uh, if you look at identical twins, 90% uh, of autism actually has a genetic component. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, it's very important to make these under, uh, to understand the, these contributions of genes to, to these type of personality uh, disorders, behavioral disorders, if they are categories of a disorder. But in many, many cases, they're just societal variants. Um, if you look at uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or Asperger's syndrome, uh, many of the professors, in fact, in the faculty will have some of these uh, characteristics, right? <laughs> it's actually quite true. I'll come back to this a little bit later. And so, so, you know, we have many CEOs who come through our laboratories. The foundation brings them through to try to raise money. And, and uh, I remember Conrad Black asked the question, you know, can you do a genetic test to identify someone like myself? Uh, really, somebody who's really obsessive compulsive and uh, type A personality. I said, you can do that, you know, you can figure that out in a 10 minute interview with an individual. <laughs> but, um, but there are characteristics and we are finding some mutations and variants that are associated with these different behavioral conditions. I'll come back to autism a little bit later, but for uh, hundreds, a hundred years or so, um, uh, the mothers were blamed, they were called refrigerator mothers, uh, mothers of autistic individuals because they were blamed for not raising their children in a loving environment. And that's why the child became autistic. And it wasn't until genetic studies of identical twins in the 1970s showed that, in fact, it's a genetic, it's mainly a genetic condition uh, that society started to change. But even up until 20, I say 20 years later, in fact, 10 years ago, this was still one of the um, um, negative outcomes of, of this type of misunderstanding of science and society. Okay, so I'm going to use this slide to really move into more of the medical applications of my talk. And also to give you a little bit of uh, uh, something to talk about at the water cooler tomorrow, tomorrow at your, in your office. So because you're studying genetics, by definition, uh, it's, it, it's inherited, as I mentioned in my earlier slides. So if you're studying genetics of a certain individual, could be myself or yourself, um, it's going to reveal information on your, on your parents and your siblings and all of your, your, ans your direct ancestors. I was giving a talk a few years ago uh, to Supreme Court judges and it was in Halifax and there was a news reporter in the audience and what she picked up on my talk was um, I was describing how we do genetic studies and one of the biggest problems we have is actually non-paternity. It really kills our statistical analyses if who you think is dad is actually not dad. It can, compil you know, it can kill any power when you're doing these type of association studies. So. Um, so we, you know, depending on where you are, if you're in the Ottawa Valley or, uh, you know, Toronto or wherever, uh, over five percent of actually of, of individuals are non are the result of non-paternity. Okay, so you think, you know, keep this in mind when, uh, you know, you go back home and talk to your family. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my point for showing this really is, is when we do genetic studies, uh, as I mentioned, it's information that gives you. Um, on your past, your present, and your future. Okay, so genetic changes that uh, lead to clinical outcomes are what we call mutations, uh, and these can actually cause directly or predispose to disease. There's over 6,500 genetic diseases that are documented in a, a database called the uh, Online Mendelian Inheritance of Man database, OMIM database. So things like cystic fibrosis, CF is a, a recessive disorder. Um, caused by mutations in, in a gene, you have to inherit a faulty copy from each of your parents. So if your parents are carriers, you would have a one in four chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis. It's a so-called so uh, um, monogenic or single gene disorder. There's genetic influences on complex and infectious diseases, cancer, diabetes, uh, HIV. And, and in fact, nine of the 10 leading causes of global death has some genetic uh, component. In fact, heart disease is number one. Uh, the reason we study genetics at SickKids Hospital in Toronto is that 70% of the admissions to all pediatric hospitals have some genetic contribution. So we need to understand the underlying causes, and I'll show you how we use this information a little bit later. Uh, and in fact, over 90% of the chronic disorders in children have a genetic component. 
Okay, so um, throughout your lifetime, your, your germ cells will, will call it, gather probably something in the order of 200 different mutations. Okay, so these are single nucleotide or small changes in your DNA that typically don't hit any critical genes. But in some cases, they will. In some cases, they may be in the sperm that's passed on into your offspring. So these are new changes, new genetic changes that can lead to specific diseases. In some cases, diseases are inherited. So you have a family history, say a breast cancer or cystic fibrosis, for example. Um, you'll know a little bit about the family history if you talk to your, your relatives. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can actually use this genetic information in a predictive way. So um, this is a very, very powerful statement. The value of pre-symptomatic diagnosis. In about 20% of patients, sudden death is the first sign of heart disease. A strong statement. So if you have a family history, again, a, a, a written or a, um, a verbal family history is, is still the most powerful thing. But we think going forward, in fact, the DNA sequence will be more predictive. So the current healthcare paradigm is you have um, a diagnosis, some type of disease monitoring, and then hopefully either uh, a therapeutic treatment or perhaps surgical treatment, some type of uh, treatment. And we think now with new technologies and, and advances in human genetics research, the new paradigm, and I'll give you some examples of how this is already occurring, will be uh, at some early level of, of the diagnosis uh, and perhaps maybe at birth, you will have information captured about your, your genome, your genetic information. This may assist in early diagnosis, preventative action, design of newer, better drugs or, or specific drugs that may work better for you uh, or therapies and ultimately improve survival or quality of life. And I'll come back to this a little bit later, but I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we um, carry this information around and how we actually use it in our day-to-day -day, day, uh, lives. And uh, of course, I put this up for Waterloo here, realizing it's, it's a little bit outdated, but I should put the uh, Blackberry curve. Or Um, but I'm going to give you uh, some examples of how we're actually already using this type of genetic information uh, based on discoveries that we made in our laboratory. But before I get there, the technology, as was pointed out earlier, is, is really moving extremely quickly. And I, I think we're poised in biology and genetics, genomics, to actually do the perfect experiment. For the last 100 years or so, we've been doing imperfect experiments. We've been doing association studies uh, using partial information on the genome. Uh, we're almost at the point now where we actually can capture all of the DNA sequence at a relatively inexpensive cost. So for 50 years, we've been using uh, cytogenetics or karyotyping. In fact, I remember the first uh, Lily Pasternak showing us in, in first year biology here how to cut these chromosomes out. Uh, this is the karyotype of, the, of, the, uh, of a human genome. This is a male because you have an X and a Y chromosome here. This still is the standard uh, clinical genetic test used in hospitals. Believe it or not, it's 50 years. It was first implemented to, to identify trisomy 21 and Down syndrome about 50 or 60 years ago. It's still the number one genetic test that's performed across North America, but that's changing very, very quickly. Um, microarrays, these are uh, little uh, chips, uh, little pieces of glass slides that have DNA probes. Uh, the microarrays in 2007, uh, for the first time we had over a million probes. And I know there's people at Waterloo who are doing these experiments and uh, we run thousands of these experiments any, any given year in our laboratory in Toronto. Uh, and I'll come back to how we use these in a moment. And more recently, the advances in microscopy, as, uh, as the president pointed out, have allowed us, and imaging, have allowed us to capture DNA sequences directly at a very high resolution. Uh, in fact, in our laboratory now, we can sequence 40,000 times more DNA this year compared to last year. And the advances in DNA sequencing are actually outstripping uh, computing, the computing industry, uh, including quantum computing, sorry, but, um, and exceeding Moore's law. So Moore's law, of course, is uh, doubling a CPU power and I think it's 18 to 24 months or so. Uh, it's really a hockey stick curve in DNA sequencing. It's going through the roof. I'll come back to this a little bit later, um, but uh, the advances are continuing even faster than most of us would have predicted. Okay, so, but uh, what I wanted to talk about is we're already using genome scanning technologies now uh, in, um, in the clinical setting. So th they're starting to supplant the karyotyping approach because they're much higher resolution. And there's a whole new field that's grown up uh, called personalized genomics or um, direct-to-consumer testing. Some of you may, may have had your DNA test and I'll talk a little bit about this later. So I'm going to give you four examples uh, of applications of these new technologies uh, in the clinical setting based on work that we've done or discoveries that we've made. Uh, 
uh, and how they, they've influenced individuals' lives, their understanding of themselves and their families. So we did an experiment using these microarrays. Uh, we took 100 cases that came through clinical genetics at the Hospital for Sick Children who had been tested using every molecular test known. These are individuals, children who have some type of global growth developmental delay or abnormality. They checked the carry type, we checked all the known genes for mutations and couldn't find anything. Uh, we ran their DNA on microarrays and then using this type of uh, presentation here, you can see that this individual in this lane here has a, instead of a, a, a dark red color, has a pink color, which means that individual has a deletion on one chromosome. And in fact, that's a deletion of about a million base pairs of DNA on chromosome seven. And it encompasses a gene called the um, long, long QT cardiac arrhythmia gene. So if you only have one copy of this gene instead of two copies, which most of us, in the, in the, actually all of us here probably have, uh, you're predisposed to developing uh, cardiac arrhythmias early in life. So these are the kids that actually drop dead on the basketball court or in the hockey, in the hockey rink. Um, we detected this individual actually through a genetic dis disease study, a, a basic research study we had in our laboratory, and identified this child very early on to have this genetic defect. And now that child is monitored and um, is monitored on a yearly basis and uh, will be tested going forward to, to make sure that it's not exposed to certain excess exercise and things like this. So this is a predictive form of information that influenced that child's life. But we found doing this testing of 100 individuals that over 20% we could find the mutation in that individual not found in either of the parents. And we think as we have newer technologies, we'll find more and more of these mutations. In particular, DNA sequencing will allow us to test all the genes in one single test. Um, this child actually went through uh, eight different clinics at SickKist. Uh, parents had to come in and they, you know, they never got an explanation of why their child was sick until we ran this one uh, test here. Um, we've been checking now the DNA of thousands of uh, Canadian uh, autistic children. Uh, so these are families that have either autism or uh, Asperger's syndrome. Uh, the prevalence is one in 150. Uh, newborns have a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome. And what we found when we looked at their DNA using the same genetic microarray I talked about in the last two slides, we found that in um, upwards of 10% of cases, in fact, in the Canadian cohort, it was 7%. But uh, in a new study we have, it's 10%. Uh, we found a change in their DNA, usually a deletion of, of a portion of one chromosome in the human genome. And usually it was a deletion of a very important gene that encoded a protein involved in early neurodevelopmental um, features of, of the brain. So, um, so this is really critical information because, as I pointed out earlier, for, for you know, decades the parents were being blamed for the, the not raising their family properly. Uh, so for at least 10% of the families now, we actually have a, an explanation of why their child is autistic. It's a random change that occurs in the DNA. We all have these random changes. We're all genetic mutants, as I showed you on my, my third slide. We all have these variants. In some cases, they lead to brown hair. In other cases, they lead to autistic tendencies. So uh, initially, um, we can transfer this data back to the family. The question we're most asked uh, most often is, what's the chance my second child will be autistic? If you have one of these new mutations, one of these new changes, in fact, your likelihood of your second child being autistic returns back to the population average, which is 7%. So it greatly influences uh, family planning decisions. And in fact, uh, for many other genetic disorders, and this will be coming with autism, you can use um, predictive genetic testing uh, to, um, to determine early on if the child actually uh, will have the same genetic change or not, the second child. So, um, identification of these changes is very important because in some instances you can have the children enrolled in uh, early behavioral language training. Uh, the earlier they're enrolled, the, the more positively they respond. And we've, now that we've identified some of the underlying basic causes, we can think about developing uh, in a more rational way tar targeted therapeutics for uh, autistic individuals. <clears throat> Now this is a, a really great example of, of, the, of the past information, the present information, and the future information. So um, there's a, a form of uh, epilepsy called pro progressive myoclonus epilepsy. This is one of the most severe forms of epilepsy. Uh, children who have this, this disorder are born and they develop completely normally. You wouldn't, you know, they're healthy individuals up until the age of 10 years old. And then they develop severe myoclonic seizures, they become wheelchair bound, and they all pass away within five to 10 years. I think there's only one child who's uh, over 20 years old now. 
This is a recessive disorder like uh, cystic fibrosis. You have to inherit one faulty copy, and then you would have, um, it, if you have these faulty copies, you will have this form of epilepsy. So we've identified now two genes uh, that have mutations that lead to this epilepsy. There's a third one we haven't found yet, but we know what chromosome it's on. Uh, when we published the, the second gene in 2004, we received a phone call from this family in South America, and it was a scenario that came up that I would have never thought of before, but I'll just try to explain it to you here. So the mother called us and she said, I have a son uh, who has this type of epilepsy. He's 18 years old now. Uh, he developed the epilepsy at age 10. And I also have an eight-year-old child, a girl, and I, I'd like to know if that child is going to have this epilepsy. Now that you found this gene, if you do the gene test, you can actually tell me this. And that's true. We could do that. They, they called the day after the paper came out, actually, in, in Nature Genetics. <laughs> so we were not expecting this. And then we said, but, you know, the problem is there's nothing we can really do at this time other than give you the information. And she, so he says, you know, why do you want to know? And she says, well, I'm also pregnant. And I, I'm 42 years old, so my, you know, ability to bear children is, I'm getting advanced in age. And I don't want to be left with no children. I want to plan to have, actually, a healthy individual uh, without this type of epilepsy. So one thing led to another. We did the prenatal testing here. Um, we found out that all three of these children actually uh, were care had, had both mutations, so they all became epileptic. And, um, but using in vitro fertilization then, we could actually identify a healthy uh, embryo. All you need to have is one healthy copy of the gene using in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And in fact, the mother's gone on now to actually have one healthy child. Okay, so this is again information past, present, and future. And this is a family, this is not this family here, but this is a family in Quebec, and their last name, their surname is Melenfant. So the, the sick child in French. So the, the, the actually surname reflected this disease being passed on through, through decades and decades of, of, of this family. So uh, this type of testing is done in cystic fibrosis regularly now, um, IVF and PGD, many different recessive disorders, uh, and there's more coming uh, as we go forward. Um, the last example is something that will impact not just rare recessive diseases, but actually all of society, and this is occurring uh, for many different uh, uh, drugs, and that is using a technology or an approach called pharmacogenomics. And the idea here is to use genetic testing to predict how you might respond either uh, positively, negatively, adversely, or in different ways to specific drugs. Um, if you look at this, this figure here, you can have, look at a heterogeneous population. All of us have different uh, variations in our genome. And if you um, then run them on a microarray to get a DNA profile, you can then do an association t study to see which individuals in the population may actually have a desired response to a drug a no response or toxic side effects. And so this is the, the theory. Um, and there's over in North America something in order of perhaps 200,000 deaths per year that are due to adverse drug reactions. So uh, the idea here is if you can actually test their DNA and decide you know, who may respond either in a negative way or determine the dosage that they need to take and have them carry that information around uh, in advance so that these decisions can be made at the right time during their lifetime. Um, they may actually have a positive outcome instead of a negative outcome. And in fact, at SickKids now, there are um, mutations in a, in a subclass of genes that actually lead to uh, uh, increased risk uh, of, of deafness, of a genetic form of deafness, if you uh, administer gentamicin, which is an antibiotic to, to the children. And um, this is just an example where, while they're not carrying this information around on their OHIP card yet, in the future we think that the, the family members or the children themselves will actually have this data on their OHIP card that will warn the clinician from giving them this type of antibiotic. Okay, or perhaps if you go in for a blood thinner, like you, you're taking a warfarin, for example, based on your genetic profile, you may actually have an indicator on whatever, your credit card or your, you know, uh, your watch or your OHIP card that, that tells the clinician what dosage might be best for you based on your genetic profile. That's the concept of pharmacogenomics. There are actually 12 drugs in the market now that uh, have some type of genetic test attached to the, the decision if you're going to use this drug or not. Um, so everything comes back to technology. The reason that we can do these really neat, nifty things is the ability to see and do experiments in a higher resolution way. 
And it was mentioned earlier, the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project was an international project that assembled a, a composite uh, reference DNA sequence. It's a mosaic sequence. It's actually comprised of over 700 different donor chromosomes from around the world. Um, and it's, it served as a reference to do lots of other experiments. And, but the first genome sequence of an identified individual was actually of Craig Venter. He was a, a, a scientist entrepreneur who ran Solera Genomics, which was a company that was doing genome sequencing. Um, and since this time, there's now actually eight published genome sequences, but there's something on the order of a thousand or so that have been completed that have not been published yet. I was at a meeting last week, and uh, uh, the tally is probably over a thousand or so. So this is becoming uh, relatively common, although it's still quite expensive. <laughs> It costs probably something in the order of fifty to hundred thousand dollars to get the quality of sequence that uh, is close to the the Venter DNA sequence shown here, <clears throat> um, but it's plummeting. There's an X Prize. Uh, if you know what these X Prizes are, uh, there's actually a Google X Prize. I think that Waterloo may be involved with, but the first X Prize was to put a, a non-NASA uh, um, uh, spaceship into space. So the, sec the first biology X Prize was to, uh, to sequence 1,000 genomes, sorry, 100 genomes in 10 days for less than $10 million. Okay, this was announced a few years ago. There's a company that uh, will probably take a run at, at it uh, soon, but the problem is I'm actually on the advisory board and, and there's no rules to compare against yet. So, <laughs> so we have to come up with a good set of rules to compare, compare the data against. But anyways, the, the point is that we think that in the next five years, certainly it would be less than $1,000 perhaps $100 or so, and some people are predicting free, if you use a, a, a Google, uh, an internet uh, type model, to capture DNA sequences. So at the hospital, we're, we're thinking about, you know, what will happen if you um, are, have the ability to capture your child's genome sequence after they're born and before you leave the hospital. So in the same way that you're offered the cord blood, you know, you can pay to have your cord blood collected. You may, you may have to pay, say, $100 or $1,000 to have your child's genome sequence collected. So what would you do with that data? You know, would you keep it and how would you make sense of it uh, when they, you kick them out of the house to go to Waterloo? Do you give them their genome sequence as a going away present? <laughs> you know, who, control, who controls the data? Uh, how do you make sense of it? These are real life questions that are, that are impacting us now and I'll give you a few more examples here. Um, but you know, how are you going to carry this sequence around? Uh, the FDA has actually already approved uh, using this type of information to be carried on microchips. And these are just some press clippings here to show you this. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, Craig Venter's genome sequence, when we completed the assembly, not all of the raw data, but in fact, you can carry it around on a typical CD. You could have it on a USB key. It's really, it's six gig gigabytes of information, the assembled sequence. So the underlying sequence is much more complex. But that type of data you could easily carry around on a microchip, microchip that's implanted under your skin. So will you know, we'll we decide to do this and how we, you'll definitely have it on your BlackBerry. You could email people as you go around your DNA sequences. Um, Direct-to-consumer testing. Maybe before I go into this, how many people in the room has, have had their DNA scanned by a company like 23andMe or Navigenics? Okay. None. This is the first time. Good. Um, so the microarrays that I talked about a little bit earlier with the 1 million uh, DNA probe features um, is the exact same microarrays we use in our, our basic research laboratories. Uh, there's companies in the states. Um, the largest one is 23andMe and is actually formed by um, Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of Google's wife. So they have really deep pockets behind this company. Uh, they're performing um, uh, testing using these microarrays of people who would spin a tube uh, you get the DNA, you mail it off to this company, they run this microarray, and then you get um, some data back that shows your probability of, of, based on academic published literature, of developing one of something in the order of maybe 30 or, 30 or so different common diseases. Okay, so you spit in a tube, mail it to them. Uh, 23andMe cost about $500 now. Navigenics is a little bit more. They send you back data, uh, a link to a website, a private website, and you can get an estimate if you have uh, an increased risk of developing, say, type 2 diabetes or coronary heart disease. They have cystic fibrosis on here now. Um, it's very, very early days, and the predictive value of this data is in great, great debate in our community. Some of the tests are very predictive. Other ones, they don't mean anything at all. But the point is that this is out there now. Um, uh, you can go, instead of having to go to your hospital, you can have this type of test done via um, the mail and then the internet coming back to you. <coughs> 
So I've had this done and, and uh, I just wanted to show you that my genome is actually uh, really quite boring if you look at it, <laughs> the way it's presented here. Um, so these are the chromosomes here and, and, and you can use the same genetic data captured on these microarrays to look at your ancestry, okay, so your past. Uh, so I have a really white bit, white bread kind of background <laughs> here. I was, I was really kind of hoping I would find something interesting so I go back to my family reunion and say, you know, well, what the hell is going on here? You guys didn't tell me about this. But in fact, uh, and, and for me, based on this genetic type of scan, although really the data is still quite leak, weak, I'm, for the 20 disorders they test for, I'm, I'm very healthy according to this website. I was actually happy. Um, some people have, have actually identified that they are uh, in increased risk for very important diseases, but typically you find out that you're okay. Um, the resolution of testing will get much, much better as we go forward. But uh, we looked a little bit closer at, at my DNA, for example, and, and these are only looking at these single nucleotide changes, the SNP changes. But we looked at the, the copy number variation data, and this is not a test that you can get through the company, uh, and found that I actually have two deletions on, uh, very close to each other on chromosome 13. And I tell you this be, not because, you know, it's that important. <laughs> uh, it's, to, to make a few points. One is um, the first deletion is quite large and it's probably, I'm probably the only person in the world that has this genetic change in DNA, so I, except for my mother. I got this, this change from my mother. She's very, very proud of this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> of her four sons, and she gave this to me. We don't know what it means yet, but, um, but in fact, that first change deletes a gene that up until a week ago had no idea what the gene did. And I was giving a talk in Banff last week and I went back and checked in the databases. In fact, now we know based on animal model studies in, uh, in uh, Drosophila, fruit fly, they've now studied the function of that gene and it's involved in neuron development. There's not a lot known, but there's one paper published on it. So I only get, you know, I only have two copy, one copy instead of everyone else here, I'm sure has two copies of this gene involved in neuron development. I don't know what that means. It could be a, probably a bad thing, but maybe not, maybe a good thing. Uh, but this other change is actually quite large also and, and it's unique to my family. Um, and it, it deletes uh, a gene that's involved in uh, DNA metabolism, essentially. If you have two genetic uh, changes, a recessive disorder, you have a very severe uh, metabolic disorder. It leads to, um, it's really incompatible with life, actually. So that tells me, and you know, I already knew this, that I, I shouldn't marry you know, my sister. I don't have a sister to marry because that would <laughs> increase the risk. I shouldn't marry any f a female cousin because I don't have a female actually cousin of this because it's passed from my, my maternal lineage. But it does give me some information and this is really low resolution data. We're only looking at one million points across the genome. With the complete genome sequence we get all six billion chemical bases of data and that's coming fast. That's my point here. Uh, this is what President Obama's genome would look like or um, Tiger Woods for example. So you have this mixing of uh, ancestral contributions to the chromosomes, so the different colors shown from Europe or Africa. So it gives us data on our, on our genetic uh, background or lineage. And I, I find this is the most fascinating study. Uh, for a long time it was debated hotly in the community, um, in particular in the forensics, forensics community, if you could use these type of genetic markers for absolute discrimination of individuals in world populations. Uh, and there's lots of data to suggest that you can. Um, the, the old markers that were used, uh, that are still used in forensic studies are microsatellite markers. Um, they're very, very informative, but there's not that many of them in the genome. But now with these new genetic, these microarrays and DNA sequencing, you will be able to have absolute genetic uh, discrimination of each individual. And there's a, a scientist, uh, Carlo Bustamante at Cornell, who did this really cool study where he took DNA from 1,000 randomly selected individuals across Europe it was anonymized DNA samples, run a, a microarray that had only 500,000 markers. In fact, this is a, a two generations ago. And then did um, a, a comparative study uh, looking at the princi principal components of the underlying genetic characteristics of each individual in these populations and can, could group them based on the commonality of shared genetic markers. And that's just what you're seeing here on, on two axes looking at different colors of individuals have are more common sequences than others. And you can see how it's plotted here. It actually represents the specific countries uh, across Europe. And he could actually show that for many of the families, he could map their origin based on comparisons down to 100 kilometers within a given country. 
And for example, in Germany, where they're speaking multiple languages, you could actually group them based, in many cases, on geographical regions that um, were associated with uh, the language that they speak. So this is a low resolution test. When we did Craig Venter's genome, we could map his genome back to a specific village actually using public data uh, in um, two generations prior to that in uh, northern England, which in fact is where his family originated from. So you might imagine as we get the genome sequences of everybody in the population, uh, if you, know, you watch soap, soap, soap operas and you kind of forget you know, who you are, you go into a coma and you need to know, you just run your DNA sequence and you'll be able to actually map it back exactly to where you come from. But there's lots of actually practical applications. Uh, adopted children, for example, who don't know their genetic history or um, individuals who, um, uh, who don't have a family history of disease could actually use this data uh, to map back to genetic disease but also to these, this type of geographical location. <clears throat> uh, I have a few more slides. Um, you know, so I talked a lot about the, uh, the genome that we have in all of our cells, but your, you and your genome are not alone. Uh, there's a whole new field in genomics called uh, metagenomics, um, and, uh, and it's a study of, of genomics, the genomes of, of organisms in, in the environment, and the environment here is actually the human species. Uh, there's been studies looking at the microbiome. So these are the, the bacterial flora of the different, um, <clears throat> different uh, physical locations in the human body. And you can't really see this, but each of the pie graphs is a representation of different types of bacteria that are found in different tissues in the body. So using these DNA sequencing technology, and some of this is going on here at Waterloo, people can sequence you know, entire um, uh, water samples, for example, from, um, from oceans or the bottoms of mine shafts or near oil deposits and get a, a DNA profile of what the organisms around that environmental uh, uh, location actually look like. And what's striking in, in the human species is actually there's more cells, there's more bacterial cells in the, in the gut flora than actually the entire body, okay, the, the, the trillions of cells in the bodies. And this the flora, the, the, the flora in the gut actually changes throughout your lifetime. Uh, and we now know that for some diseases, um, actually uh, Crohn's disease, uh, colitis, um, the, mi the mic microbial flora is actually critically important. So it's the relationship of the bacteria, for example, uh, in your gut and your own genome, how they interact with each other that can lead to predisposition to particular diseases. And there's been a beautiful study uh, uh, looking at asthma. Um, there's a village in, uh, in Germany where the, is a region where these children um, th there's essentially zero incidence of, of, uh, of asthma. And for a long time, people try to, well, why is it? And there's this age-old story of, you know, if you raise your children and you get them out in the farm and you know, rub their nose in, in the barnyard feces and things, that you, you know, your child is, is, is uh, immune to particular disorders, right? So you get them out in, in the environment. And in fact, that's exactly what this, this village does. And it's been shown now that it's the exposure to particular microorganisms early on in their lifestyle that, um, lead them to be resistant to developing certain forms of diseases. So uh, if you put a, you know, an individual who has a genetic profile based on um, genetic heritage, say in Africa, and then put them in an environment where it's completely different, they may be predisposed to different diseases than people who are raised in that environment. Uh, the technology, so brings us back to where we were. I talked mainly about genetics and genomics. Um, this is the latest technology that's probably going to change everything, and some of you, of course, are aware of this, but it's called in induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, <clears throat> essentially, the idea here is you can take a, a, a single cell, typically what's used are fibroblast cells, so you can just take a puncture of, uh, of the skin, um, and add four genes that include f four different proteins that allow that cell or group of cells to uh, reprogram themselves and then differentiate into any cell type in the body. So you can take a skin fibroblast, do this relatively simple experiment. It's not, you know, really, really easy, but it's being picked up in many laboratories now. Uh, differentiate into pluripotent stem cells, and then based on adding different growth factors, you can differentiate these into uh, heart cells and neurons in the petri plate and then do experiments to study mechanisms of disease, test therapeutics for example. 
So the biggest problem we have in our autism research is it's, it's a, a disorder of the brain of the neurons. So we can't do, obviously, experiments on the neurons of individuals who have autism. Um, and we've just got a grant from the NIH that um, we're going to be doing experiments where we've defined the genetic mutation in the autistic individual. We can then take their fibroblast cells, go through this differentiation process, and make neurons, for example. So we can study the mechanisms of the gene mutations we've identified, and hopefully in, in um, in the petri plate, do experiments to test the new therapeutics. Now, this is a slide. Uh, I just show this. This I first saw this picture uh, actually on the National Enquirer when I was in the line at the grocery store, <laughs> and you know, this is about five years ago. And I saw this, and uh, I couldn't believe it. And I said, oh, "This is on the National Enquirer. It must be must be fake." And, um, and then I went to the internet and did some searching. In fact, this was from a bio from a publication where this type of experiment experiment was performed, uh, essentially taking cells, uh, transplanting them on the back of a mouse, adding growth factors, and you get this physical structure that looks, looks like an ear. It doesn't work like an ear. You can't hear from it, but this is the concept. Okay? I show this because that's what the technology will allow, but also because, uh, just to give you an example of, you never know what's possible. So for the students who are in the audience, if you have a creative imagination and an idea, uh, biology is very, very pliable, and you probably will be actually able to complete that experiment if you really want to do it. And the question is, should we be doing some of these experiments? Um, if you look at the way genetic counseling is conducted in, in the West, so in North America and in Europe, for example, compared to the East, it's completely different. So in, in Canada, if, um, if there's, a, say, a genetic diagnosis performed, uh, say, in cystic fibrosis, <clears throat> the families are brought in and the information is shared with the families. They're educated and then the decision is based on the family. So it's very non-directive. The counselors just try to educate and let the families make decisions. So this is typically the process in socialized healthcare systems. In the states it's a little bit different, but uh, I think it's very similar. But in the east, in Asia for example, it's much, much more directive because there's pressures of populations. Uh, China has a one-child policy for example, they can be very directive. If you have a particular genetic change, actually the government can decide that you shouldn't have a child. Okay, so I think as genome information comes out, we're going to see a merging of these different policies uh, or philosophies. And I think the question that we all study as biologists in some way or another is uh, we try to quantitate nature versus nurture. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're going to get there at some point, but it's going to be a long way away. But, and, of course, there's Susan Lawley's work of non-Mendelian inheritance. I think that's going to uh, shed light on our understanding, but also confuse us a lot. <laughs> um, and I wanted to just come back to this, this idea based on the cover of Nature magazine uh, of Dolly, of nature versus nurture. Uh, I think in the end, personally, that it's going to be 50-50. Uh, half of what we are is based on our, our hard wiring, our genome, and probably half is, is based on our nurture. And this is, makes sense, yin, yin and yang balance, nature, nurture. But this is a great example. Um, Dolly was the first cloned animal. So this was an experiment that went, took place in 1996, I think it was. And um, it was a, a cell taken from a memory, memory gland from a, a, an adult female sheep. And uh, using a technique called nuclear transfer, uh, embryonic stem cells were generated and a clone of the donor mother was born, and that's Dolly the sheep, who's now passed away. <clears throat> I showed this slide for a few reasons. One is, uh, if you look at this cover of Nature magazine, it says a flock of clones. Okay? If you read the scientific article, the term clone was never used once. The, the techno technological term called nuclear transfer was used. But Nature magazine has to sell magazines, so of course they used the term clones and cloning, and it was really blown out of proportion. And in fact, only one clone was, was generated in this experiment. But since that time, of course, every barnyard animal essentially has been cloned using similar technologies. Um, <clears throat> but the second is, I had the chance to actually visit Dolly. I was uh, an advisor on a, doc a science documentary. Uh, it was probably in 2001 or maybe 1999. And, uh, and you would think that if Dolly is a cloned uh, identical uh, organism in genetically to the mother would behave like the mother, like most other sheep. I don't know a lot about how sheep behave, but um, so we went out to the, the farm at the Roslyn Institute outside of Edinburgh, and we went to the back of the farm and went in, and there was a, a whole um, uh, barn full of transgenic sheep, maybe 30 or 40 of these sheep. And as we walked towards the, 
the sheep um, got closer and closer and said, you know, how do we figure out which one Dolly is? And I pulled out a bag of Doritos I was eating, actually, at the time. And um, this one sheep came running towards, towards the group of us. There were some cameramen, and then I had my bag of Doritos. And, uh, and that, of course, was Dolly, right? And, and the reason Dolly came was not because of the, the, the cam well, it was because of the camera. She was born in an era where she was the star. Right? <laughs> Whenever she came, she didn't come to have her picture taken. She knew that close to the cameras would be people feeding her food. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm telling you this is kind of a humorous story, but in fact, it's absolutely true. Dolly was, was the most obese sheep probably in, in certainly <laughs> history because people who would come, they would give her food like me. I didn't realize, she grabbed the whole bag out of my hand and ate the thing. <laughs> but it was really interesting if you study what happened in this story uh, in pu publications in Nature, they studied her telomere length. Uh, her telomeres were shortening because of advanced senescence because they thought she was due to the cloning process. Um, and uh, probably in the end, she was just really unfit because of her, her environment, even though she was a clone. She was an identical clone. It was in her environment that actually did Dolly in. She died of obesity, essentially. Uh, so I think this is a great you know, reverse nature-nurture story, right, where you think the clone would have been uh, influenced most by the innateness or the nature, but in fact it was the environment, the nurture, that actually had more of an influence on Dolly. So in summary, summary um, <clears throat> I tried to talk to you on the points of, of what you are, and in a large part, uh, what you are is, is really influences who you are. I think it's very, very ex exciting as a species, we've evolved now to the point where we can decode our own instruction book. Uh, and we can use this information uh, to better our health. That's how we should be using this information. Um, it's in our nature to seek information, and I think now that we can actually access this information that it gives us data on our past, present, and future, we'll start to understand ourselves really for the first time in a complete way. And finally, your genes are your past, present, and your future. They're a gift from your parents, and in fact, they're a gift to your children, so you really need to take care of them. Uh, throughout your lifetime. I think that's critically important. Uh, modify your environment in the pr proper way and make sure you're passing on a good genetic heritage to, to your family. I'll stop there and I'm happy to have questions if there's still time. Thank you very much.